So at this point, this has been an ongoing issue for years and years and years. And in 2016, they decided to create a commission on a way forward to uh, determine how we can move forward. And then some voting was done uh, 2019. And the traditional expression for the United Methodist Church was agreed upon. All right. Welcome to our 36th podcast, Renew Your Mind. With us today, we have Senior Pastor Paul Gruenberg, and we have a guest today, Mike Cooper, a lay leader at our church. And um, we're going to dive into the topic that we left off on at our last podcast, number 35. And we're talking about the current and probable separation of the United Methodist Church. And um, we put out a lot of... um, we put a lot of questions out there, or we asked for a lot of questions, and we did receive some questions. So we wanted to kick off with um, with some of the questions. But before we did that, we also um, one of the main questions was is that when we talked through things, it seemed like uh, the different sides or different um, mm, what do you want yeah. to say names, Oppos- names seem to be yeah. changing a lot, and um, so we wanted to ask. Um, Pastor Paul, if he could help us understand that better. Are they really changing or did they all mean the same thing or? So in 1968, the United Methodist Church formed. Now what's happening is there is division in the church over a number of issues. The General Conference, which is the worldwide conference, which is the only conference that can make changes to our book of discipline, which are the rules and regulations we follow as United Methodists. The conference determined that there needs to be a way forward. A protocol was um, created with legislation, and it's called the, uh, what's called? The Feinberg, or the Feinberg Separation Protocol? Yeah, uh, the separation, no, the Protocol for Separation Through Grace and Reconciliation. that name, okay. The long name. And from that, there were two terms that were used in the protocol to distinguish between what is going to happen or the names of the separated churches. There's the post-separated United Methodist Church, and that that regards the centrist and the left-leaning theological uh, people of the United Methodist Church. So there's a new traditional expression, and it's called the Global Methodist Church. Okay, and so that's new from when we talked last about a month ago. When we talked uh, last, it was we were referring it to the new traditional expression, or we were refer- referencing the Wesley Covenant Association, which is the group that formed to handle the movement from the United Methodist Church to this new traditional expression, which we now know is as the Global Methodist Church. And I think we called it one other, actually two other words. I remember us calling it uh, Orthodox and traditional. Okay. I think we use those kind of interchangeably. Both of terms, yeah. Both of those fit. So I guess we do have a lot of names, don't we? Those are more descriptors of it. It's an Orthodox church. It's a traditional expression. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Global Methodist Church was actually named after our last podcast, after our last recording. So it's a relatively new name. And that's an official name in the sense that it's been registered with appropriate authorities, at least in the United States. And it is... Right now, it's a shell, but that would take those churches what they leave, when they leave that wanted to join the global Methodist Church. Okay, so that makes a lot more sense. So we have, um, I'll call it two different sides. Not sure if that's the right way to say it. And then we we linked all the different names that we associated with those two different sides, how we view it, and we listed out all those names. Right, so So the first one will be the post-separated United Methodist Church and then the Global Methodist Church. Got it. 
I think part of the problem is that it's called the Post-Separation United Methodist Church, which is a very awkward name. I mean, they don't like it when you call them the liberal um, United Methodist Church. What it is is those will be those who remain in the church who basically want to change the Book of Discipline, at least initially, on the issues of um, homosexual ordination and homosexual marriage. But there's many other differences between the two sides. Okay. All right. So once the churches separate, the Book of Discipline for the post-separated United Methodist Church, that can be modified at that point in time, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. And then what about um, the, I struggle with the names too, the new traditional expression church, which is now the global Methodist church, will they develop a book of discipline? Will they call it something different? Go ahead. It will probably be called the Book of Discipline. They've actually developed a prototype of it. It is much thinner than ours, than the current church's Book of Discipline, maybe a third the size. It covers the major areas. You can find it online under either the Global Methodist Church or the Wesleyan Covenant Association. That is still subject to ratification once the Global Methodist Church begins to meet, but it is basically... Orthodox traditional Christianity. Okay, all right. Um, so let's let's ask another question. So we've talked about how the church will separate. Can you take us back? Maybe take us high level again on the timeline and how the churches separate. Um, so at this point, this has been an ongoing issue for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And in 2016, they decided to create a commission on a way forward to uh, determine how we can move forward. And then some voting was done uh, 2019, and the traditional expression for the United Methodist Church was agreed upon. What happened is the very left-leaning theologically uh, diverse group within the United Methodist Church said, we don't care if you voted to say that we are going to be a traditionally oriented church. We're going to stay and we're going to change the church. And so that created a problem. I think I've got the years right. It was 2019. 2019. Uh, that created a problem for the people who are more orthodox in their understanding of the Bible, more traditional in their theological stances. That created a problem because we've been arguing this point back and forth for almost since the time we became the United Methodist Church, but it has really ramped up in the last 20 years. We're spending so much money, so much time arguing so now you've got this segment of people within the United Methodist Church who are refusing to leave, even though the worldwide United Methodist Church has said, we're going to remain traditional, which has created this, which has created us moving toward this separation. Mm -hmm. The legislation for the general conference to meet and vote on was to be voted on in 2020. COVID hit. That general conference was canceled and postponed till 2021. And then since our last recording session for our podcast, the 2021 general conference was also canceled and is now being pushed back to 2022. And there's, they'll still be meeting in, I believe, Minneapolis. So the timing for the actual separation cannot occur until... 2022, when the protocol has been voted on and ratified, which it should be because all of the sides have agreed to this protocol in theory. And now all we need to do is have the convening general conference vote on the protocol, the legislation to separate. And once that's done, then churches will begin uh, separating. Okay. And will it be... Um, 
in the end of 2022 or the beginning of 2022? The, the, a part of the problem with the general conference in 2022 is it is not a slam dunk that that protocol will pass. Um, there's, while all sides have agreed, there's certainly significant pushback against it from not so much progressives, because they're ready for a new church, but from the quote-unquote centrist, which I think is a misleading term that we should maybe discuss another time. But um, mm-hmm. if, if you look at the United Methodist Church as a group, it is a worldwide church. There's approximately 14 million members worldwide. About half are in the United States, and about half are in Africa. There's certainly contingents in the Philippines and Europe, but comparatively they're small. The African contingent is virtually 100% traditional. Uh, There's a few exceptions, but they're pretty minor. Mm -hmm. The U.S., it's hard to say exactly what the split is, but the control of the United Methodist Church bureaucracy certainly belongs to the progressives and the centrists. Um, And hence comes the problem because, as Pastor Paul said earlier, um, that portion of the church which control has the levers of power, basically has said, we're not going to do what you voted on. And the elections for delegates are such that they will probably have a majority of delegates, In even though they certainly do not have a majority of worldwide uh, membership, and they may not even have a majority of U.S. membership. So if you look at 7 million Africans and 2, 3 million um UMC members in America, you're looking at a majority of the church that would go to the global Methodist church. Mm -hmm. And why, again, does the power reside in that smaller percentage? In one sense, they're better organized, I suppose. When you go to annual conference, 50% Mm -hmm. of the votes come from pastors. Mm -hmm. 50% come from the lay leaders who are elected in the church to represent them. You know, Paul, you can speak to this better than I, but at least in Michigan, what I've heard is that the majority of ordained ministers, of which you are one and uh, Pastor Dan was one and and John Nail was one, the majority are liberal, Mm -hmm. more liberal um, than the general person sitting in the pews. Would you say that's a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. In fact, there was a, uh, we may have said that this before, there was a um, survey taken of U.S. United Methodist people that were not in leadership in the church, so they're not clergy, or they're not in leadership in the church, such as a chair of an ad board council or some leader in the church. These were the, pardon the expression, butts in the pew. Mm-hmm. And uh, survey was taken, and from that survey, they determined that 40% of all of the people who come to church and are not involved in leadership hold a conservative or theologically, yeah, theologically conservative uh, stance. Mm-hmm. And then 20% are centrist, and then 20% are uh, progressive, and then there was 8% other, so we're missing 2% there. Having said that, if 40% of the people who are in the pews are conservative, then the 20% that are centrist, that say they're centrist, the survey went on to say that many of those 20% still lean theologically conservative, but they tend to be a little bit more progressive socially. And the question would be, where would they land? Now, in our conference, the clergy were about 75, right around 75% liberal and 25% conservative. Yet when, as a conference, we voted as a whole, a straw vote, it ended up being about 66% uh, liberal or progressive, and then 33%. Conservative, so you can see that there are many more conservative people who are a part of the church but are not clergy. Mm-hmm. So, okay, that makes more sense then. And when the protocol happens, and hopefully it will happen, and the process then that begins 
is each annual conference will vote on which way they want to go. And at the conclusion of that, whether they choose the post-separation United Methodist Church or the Global Methodist Church, each individual church can say, we like what the annual conference did. We don't have to have a vote. They do not have to vote if they like what their annual conference did. If they do not, then there needs to be or would be a vote. And basically the threshold for a vote is, um, I can't actually remember the statistics. It could be, so the threshold for a vote, and it's up to the leadership of the church, can either be 50% plus one, right. or it can be, and I'm thinking 70, 30, or 60, 40. But what I was referencing is actually how a vote happens. Is it like if the leadership team says there should be a vote, perhaps the leadership, if the senior pastor can initiate a vote, or a certain percentage of the members can say, we want this issue to be voted on because we disagree with what the annual conference said. And then at that vote um, that takes place at that church, they would choose, like you said, Paul, either by 50% or by some higher uh, percentage. But I think realistically most churches are going to say 50-50. That just seems fair. Uh, but they can choose which way they want to go. In other words, do they want to say where their annual conference went or do they want to go to the other expression? Okay. And if I'm reading the tea leaves, which are pretty obvious, I think Michigan is going to say we want to stay with the liberal post-separation United Methodist Church. That's what their annual conference will say. That is a vote that will take place sometime after the protocol is passed, once again, assuming that it passes. So the timing then for next year would be potentially a general conference sometime in late summer. Mm -hmm. And then there will be a mm -hmm. annual conference, the Michigan Area Annual Conference. will then have a convening conference to vote on whether to stay with the post-separated United Methodist Church or to go with the new Global Methodist Church. And like Mike said, uh, chances are they're going to stay with the post-separated United Methodist Church. And then after that vote gets done, probably sometime, I'm guessing, October because that's how it was scheduled out this year. Sure. Um, then each annual church will have to determine whether they want to have a special vote or not. Okay. All right. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, I'm not sure if we simplified it or made it more complicated, <laughs> but it, in my mind, it's more simple. It's simplified. So, um, yeah. So um, if you have any questions, um, let us know. Um, we'll continue to address those. Um, if you want to join us at church in person, we have a traditional service at 9 a.m. and a contemporary service at 1045 a.m. And again, you can come in person or you can watch it via Facebook Live or YouTube. And um, again, we're located in Gaylord, Michigan, but we welcome listeners to come from anywhere. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to call the church at 989-732-5380. Thanks for joining everyone.